Dobro jutro. Šta ima? Just wait, I'm going to take a picture of you. Everyone takes pictures of people on stage. I want to take one of you guys. Too much light, actually. Okay, thank you. So, I'm Peter, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my old project, and I'm going to talk about the, my new project. And to put it kind of into context, I hope you can actually see the slides. Are they up there? Yeah, they're up there. Um, so, a little background. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about my stuff, but I want to tell it myself as well. Um, so, I'm Peter. I'm from Finland, Norway. I grew up in Sweden mostly, so I've been traveling quite a bit. And uh, the thing I've been always doing is copying. So, I got my first computer when I was nine, and it was in an old Amiga 500. And uh, being nine years old, you don't really have anything to do with a computer if you can't copy anything. So all of my friends and I, we started copying all of the things we had, games and software and all of that. And it was really important to me because I learned everything I know about computers. And I, by computers, I also learned how to communicate with other people over the internet and so on. So it's been really important to me as a person. And growing up, um, I found it really interesting that you know the person I was was a product of copying. And at the same time, there's this big corporations, especially from America, that was always saying, you know, it, it's illegal and you shouldn't file share, it's piracy, you're going to kill people. You know, it's really strange. And I got quite annoyed when I saw things like this. I hope this works with sound, actually. Yeah, didn't, didn't really fit in my world. Um, you know, I, I don't think that if I copy something, there will be terrorists that take over the world. Um, it's a really strange thing. So um, I was very interested in this thing, and some friends of mine were doing a, a project called Pirat Biron, and uh, uh, I joined them because I thought it was really interesting. And uh, there was just a very long uh, presentation about all of that project, so I'm not going to go into details about that. Uh, but essentially, Pirat Biron was kind of a think tank and, and helping people to realize what falsering was all about and, and not just telling it's good or bad, but kind of responding to the propaganda that uh, the Hollywood industry, mostly uh, Hollywood industry, was saying to, to everyone. They sent out press releases saying that, you know, uh, we lost uh, seven times more money than the gross national product of Sweden last year because of file sharing. It's like, no, you can't really lose that money because you never had it. So Pirot Biron went out and did all of these uh, press releases and very interesting projects. Um, and we went out on 1st of May and demonstrated, said that, you know, Sweden is famous for welfare, but we need a 100 megabit fiber optic network at home, otherwise we don't have welfare in this society. And today you have 100 megabit in almost every home in Sweden, and we take full credit. That's what we do. Um, a really interesting project uh, is PiratePay that Pirat Biron started. So the idea was to make Swedish slash Scandinavian file sharers have sort of a home, um, so they could share everything that they wanted to share. Um, it was, um, as a website was all in Swedish to begin with, and it was never really good coded or anything like that, but people started using it because there was no alternatives. So PirateBay grew and grew because of being the only alternative. We also wanted to promote BitTorrent, which I think most of you in here already know about, so I'm not going to go into details. Um, but at this time, most people were using Direct uh, Connect to copy films and movies and, and all of that. And that's not really good in a legal way because it's really easy to find who is sharing what. And BitTorrent is much better that way. So we promoted BitTorrent. And uh, after a while, we started seeing that all the other websites, especially big websites like Supernova, which was the really big one at this time, had um, big issues with uh, getting legal threats. So most of these other websites were shut down, not because they were illegal, but because they got a legal threat saying, we're going to sue you for all the money in the world if you don't do what we say. And people closed down their websites, and most people moved 
uh, of the file share is moved to, to Pirate Bay. So being a website in Swedish, uh, all of a sudden having 80% of the content in Spanish was quite weird. The most downloaded torrent before Pirate Bay changed to a new system which has multi uh, international languages and so on, um, the most downloaded torrent was actually um, a Swedish, uh, learn how to speak Swedish audiobook. It's really interesting. So, being Swedish, we brag a lot. So, I'm not Swedish, but I'm going to brag anyhow. Um, just to give you some idea of how big the Pirate Bay has been at times, this is one and a half years old. Uh, um, stats. But basically what happens is that people connect to Pirate Bay and ask for information about other computers in the world uh, that have information that they want to share. And uh, when Pirate Bay was still running a, a tracker system, which is not needed today, there was over 100,000 computers every, uh, every second connecting to Pirate Bay to ask about other people that have information. So it's quite a lot. And that means that Pirate Bay was over I think 80% uh, of all the BitTorrent traffic, and today it's probably bigger, which is bad. BitTorrent, as you might know, is also one of the most, is one of the biggest things in, on the internet. So if we calculate all of that together, it means that Pirate Bay users are using half of all the uh, space in the cables we have on the whole internet. And this is really interesting because we've never been more than three people working on this. And we never really spent a lot of time, maybe an hour of, of work per, per week, and that has been mostly on rebooting computers. We never really spent time on the system making new things. Pirate has been, has been looking the same since 2005, I think. And it doesn't look good, it doesn't work well, um, but it's still there because no one wants to take it down from, from the crew who's been running it. The interesting thing with having a system that is essentially responsible for half of the traffic on the internet is also when someone is doing bad things. So, as I said, we've always been three people. It's been me, Gottfried, and Frederick. And I remember one time that Frederick, who likes to have a beer or two or ten, um, was in the uh, data center and he tripped over a cable. And Pirate Bay went down for a couple of days and half of the traffic of the internet just vanished because he was a bit drunk. It says something about the stability of the internet. So we started to get these um, uh, legal threats as well. And they were quite funny. So uh, most people that got these threats, they just closed, they closed down their site. And uh, we decided that we're stupid enough to not do that. So instead, when we got letters from, uh, from the US, you know, we responded. So we sent a picture like this. This is of a uh, Norwegian polar bear. But we said, you know, you have issues with copyright. Hmm, is that really important? We have polar bears in our streets. They try to eat us. You know, come back after we're done with that problem. And these lawyers, they didn't really understand if this is true or not. Are we kidding with them? Or is this crazy people? And uh, it was quite funny. We also sent suggestions of different things they could shove up, shove up their asses. Specific models, types of things. Uh, we sent a picture of the world showing United States, water, Europe, Sweden, not the same country, not the same laws, all of that. Ended it with go fuck yourself, things like that. We also published all of them. So if you go to Pirate Bay still today, you can see all of the legal threats that were entertaining. There was like a couple of them every day. Um, but we just published the ones that we actually responded to. That was not automatic. This is my favorite one. This is from a German company called Linotype. They uh, buy fonts from different people that create fonts. So if you use uh, Word or anything like that, you will have a font called Helvetica, and they own that font. And they were really upset uh, that Helvetica and some other fonts were available using Pirate Bay. So they sent a legal threat with a contract saying, sign here, you have to pay us 25,000 uh, euros, and you will have to agree to never allow anyone to download anything again that is part of our uh, uh, list of things we own and blah, blah, blah. So we really like copying and remixing. So we took their legal threat and we reversed it. So we said, you have to pay us money and you have to stop sending us legal threats and you have, have to promise to never do this again and sign here. And to make it even funnier, we also used all of the fonts they complained about. <laughs> yes. So the, the, the really sad thing is that we always responded like this. We uh, sometimes were really clever, actually, like this. But the more clever you are, the less response you get. So they never replied to this.
That was kind of bad. And they also never paid, so we should sue them for that. Um, Pirate Bay was, you know, always this uh, kind of face of a movement. Um, I don't really like the movement because I think people should, you know, move by themselves, kind of. Uh, but because of Pirate Bay and all of the tension, uh, Rick uh, here started uh, the Pirate Party because there were so many people in Sweden that was upset about the current situation of, of, of state in, in Sweden with um, falchers being sued and then going, the police are giving out more and more power to companies and so on. So they made a really good election, um, is it two years ago, I think, where they actually got seven point something percent of the votes in Sweden for the European Union parliament election. So there's supposed to be two, but there is one parliamentarian working full time in the European Union uh, discussing these issues, which is really great. And it shows that a lot of people are really interested in these things. We were never part of that from Pirat Bjorn or Pirate Bay. We thought it was you know, more interesting to do technology or work in, as a lobby group or artist group, whatever we, you know, we don't, we don't like responsibility, so that sucks, but Rick loves responsibility, so he's a bit stupid that way, um, but that's just the thing we do. We like people do different things. But one thing that we, one type of responsibility that we kind of took ourselves is that we were really not into um, censorship of the internet. We realized that Pirate Bay had a lot of visitors and there was a lot of people that were really interested in this. So we started using this attention we got for positive things. Um, and this is especially one thing that was really important that we did in Sweden. It was in uh, Denmark, there was a big law case, a uh, lawsuit about uh, where the uh, internet service providers were sued by the Danish record industry. Uh, and the reason was that you could use the internet service providers to buy music from Russia. And in Russia, the price is much lower than in Denmark. And it's totally legal. It's this globalization thing, because you can buy across borders and so on. So they couldn't really stop that. Um, and this site in, in Russia, allofmp3.com, was legal, totally legal. And they even paid artists and everything the, the way they should. It's just lower price, because it's in a country with less money. So the internet service providers were sued because when they allow people to buy this music, they would have a copy of the music themselves in their cables that they own, and they would not have the license for it. And they lost all the way to the Danish Supreme Court, which is so crazy. Um, and ISPs in, in Denmark, they usually operate also in Sweden. So one of these ISPs decided that it would be really important for them as a tool of showing how much they care about artists and art and so on, and uh, that they decided that since we have to block all of mp3.com in, in Denmark, we will also do it on, for our customers in Sweden and say we're on the side of the artist and do a big PR campaign. And we were super upset about this. So we started a campaign against this ISP. So we uh, put up a sign uh, for all users of this ISP on the Pirate Bay. So when you came to the site, you couldn't do anything besides see the sign, which said, your ISP sucks, so you have to change. And there was the phone number for the ISP, and it was a ready-made email where you could say, I, you know, I'm suspending my contract with you, you're not giving me the internet access, you give me partial internet access. So you're in violation of our contract. And what happened is that I think over 20% of their customers call the first or second day and complain to the uh, customer uh, support. And a lot of people started changing ISP. So uh, the day after we started this campaign, uh, the CEO of this company called me up and said, but what if we promise to not censor uh, Pirate Bay? We can, we can do that. You can have it in writing and everything. We're like, no, we don't care. You know, we're much bigger than you. So you know, you're going to lose all your customers or you're going you're gonna to change. And he said, well, we can't do that. We can't go back on this. It's too big. But he got fired. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> And they also stopped censoring after, I think, a week. And they removed the blockage and said, well, this is not the right thing. We should actually have a due process, kind of the basis of a democracy. But it, was, it showed people in Sweden, and it also showed the record industry, particularly, that we had some sort of power, and they were not pleased with that. So they were really starting to be annoyed by what we were doing. And they couldn't really understand what we were doing. They didn't understand this internet thing. And we also are a bit strange in their eyes. They're not just like the regular people they meet that want something for free. We uh, tried buying a country, for instance. So maybe you have heard of Sealand, which is a country outside of the UK. Uh, it's a small platform that was used during the Second World War for anti-aircraft things. 
Uh, and someone went there in the late 60s or early 70s and, and said, this is our country, it's called Sealand, because there has to be an old Sealand when there's a new one. Um, and they wanted to sell the country a couple of years ago, because they're like 70 years old, so they can't really live on a platform in nowhere. Uh, it's really strange. So we said, oh, let's buy it, you know. We'll get some money on the internet, we'll use this crowdfunding thing. So we opened a website called buysealand.com. And we said, we're going to buy the nation, and the first thing we're going to do is going to say, we don't have copyright in this nation. And we're going to host things. We're going to get fiber cables to this uh, small platform and going to host everything that people don't like. You know, whatever it is, no censorship, freedom of expression, freedom of everything, and we're going to do this thing. And I think in 24 hours, we raised uh, like $25,000 for the nation, which is kind of amazing. And this was, I don't know if it was serious or a prank, but it was kind of interesting. Uh, the most interesting thing was the day after when we started seeing um, uh, the Prince of Sealand had to fly to the US to be a part of some talk show with the top lawyers from Disney and Warner Brothers discussing the problem they would have when we have our own country. And they had no clue if we were who we were. They didn't know that we were drinking beer, eating pizza, and coming up with a stupid idea like this. Um, they really thought we were really, really serious and we wanted to invade things and so on, like terrorists. So they started checking us out to find out who we were and what we were doing and how we did all of this. And we became stranger and stranger. Um, all of a sudden, we said we were an art project. Art is really weird for people in the art industry and the entertainment industry because they don't understand art mostly. So we had the buzz that we had a long presentation about, so I'm not going to talk about that. But it was really interesting because they were so frustrated by not understanding how we worked or in what way, whatever. They, you know, they were just like out of it. So what you do at that time, you send private investigators after people. So anyone in here had a private investigator following them? Oh, no. Okay, I can tell you the story how it is. Um, so, as I said, we were three people, and uh, we're very different, all of us. None of us would vote for the same party. Uh, none of us would like, listen to the same music. If we talk about anything that has something to do with internet or democracy, well, not even democracy, but like the internet stuff, we would not agree at all. So we're very different. And some things are very similar, though, like Gottfried is a real computer nerd, like he does only work on his computer all the time. So we saw the files from the private investigator. He'd been following us for six weeks, uh, and Gottfried, his file was, I think, one page for six weeks, because they saw him once. He never went out. <laughs> he was just home working all the time. And so they had, like, record. Someone came, two pizzas, you know, single guy with two pizzas go in, two empty boxes coming out, kind of. Frederick drinks a lot, so he likes to party. So they had like this stack of paper, seen every bar in Gothenburg every day, every week. It's really, really strange. Uh, I noticed them the first time when um, there was uh, a car outside my house. Uh, so I, I live in southern Sweden, and it's very close to Denmark. And all of a sudden, there's a Danish car on my street. Um, which there usually isn't a Danish car. It's also a very expensive car, which there usually isn't on my street. So, you know, it's very dark outside, and, you know, I'm coming with a pizza for once uh, back home, and there's a big flash going off inside a car, which is kind of stupid to use a flash when you're inside a car, because everyone can see it. Um, and I go over to this car to check out who is this guy. And all of a sudden, the car just starts speeding, and like from a scene from a Hollywood movie, the tires are just like squealing and it's really bad. Uh, but I know this internet thing, right? So I, I wrote up the, the numbers of the car and I went into the internet to search who owns the car, because that's public information in Scandinavia. And if you want to become a private investigator, there are two things. One, as I said, don't use a flash inside a car late at night. And two, if you really need a car for your work, and you have a company called Private Investigator something, don't register the car to the company. <laughs> it's stupid. So, and also, if you really are not interested in, or you want to find out what people are doing on the internet, why send private investigators after them? You know, it's really stupid. So, in the end, they were really, really upset, didn't have any clue about anything, so then they just started being corrupt, or continued being corrupt. So they, um, the Hollywood industry went to the White House 
told the White House, we have a problem, so get Sweden over here and make them our bitch. Um, and Sweden became the bitch. So the Minister of Justice of Sweden came with his whole staff to the White House, and they started talking about the Pirate Bay. And the prosecutor in Sweden said that the Pirate Bay is probably not doing anything illegal. He also said we were very clever, um, which I have in my CV nowadays. Um, and, you know, said he couldn't do anything about the Pirate Bay. But six weeks later, there was a big raid in Sweden. Uh, 50 police officers came and stole our computers illegally, and 180 other computers as well from 10 different locations, because they couldn't find out where we could have the servers. There was a picture with the GPS coordinate map on the website, but, you know, we could be lying, so that's why they had to go to 10 places. Um, it was a really strange thing, and they were probably sure that if they took all of the servers, we wouldn't be back online. Uh, and, you know, it took three days for us to actually come back online. Uh, and it would have been two days if it wasn't for all the beer and pizza. Uh, but it, the interesting thing was that, you know, Pirate Bay has been down quite a lot. So, you know, as I said, Frederick tripping over cables has been down for like a week sometimes. Gottfried was sick, couldn't restart a computer, and everyone else was not around. It had been down for like four or five days. But when the U.S. government and the Swedish government are making this corrupt thing with politicians, you know, being super corrupt, we were down for three days. And that was kind of fun, because we were telling... Uh, we, we told the world that the Pirate Bay is back online when we were outside protesting outside the government building in Sweden. So it became very clear to me, since no one is laughing, I, su I assume you don't speak Swedish and read the banner. This banner shows the whole problem. It's about generations. So the banner says, give us back the server or we're going to take your fax machine. And this is, this is really, really the whole essence of what happened. People were super upset in Sweden. The Pirate Party got thousands and thousands of new members. I think over 50,000 members in a very short time. And it really exploded. Everyone started talking about file sharing. And this was great because we really needed that. At the same time, Pirate Bay was maybe like the third 3,000 something on the top list of websites in the world. After this, it was in the top 500. And today, it's top 50. I think in, in Serbia, it's top 10 or something like that. It's really, really big, and no one cares about it from the, you know, the old administrators. They just hate it. We all want it to go away, but as long as it's there, it's there, and you know, that's fine. And as I said before, we started getting this attention, and it must be really frustrating for the opposition, so to, so to speak, that we were invited all over the world to talk about these things and make people aware of why you know, we did what we did and talk about it as an, an influence. This is, for instance, me and Richard Stallman. We met with President Lula in Brazil two years ago. And that was a really weird experience, because I can't even go to the Swedish government and talk to my ministers, but I go to one of the biggest countries in the world, and this you know, really interesting president comes over to me, gives me a hug, and says, in Portuguese, which I don't speak, um, says, Peter, we don't have an extradition treaty with Sweden. <laughs> you know? It's a different world. So one of the things we usually speak about is, you know, why is there this problem? Is there a problem at all? And if we analyze it uh, for, for myself, what is the problem with file sharing? Well, for me, it's I get too much shit. You know, I want to get rid of all the stuff I get. I have too much information. I have too much music. It's not how much a song is or how much a movie is. Uh, you know, the price tag has no interest for me anymore. It's just how get I get rid of the things I don't like. And at the same time, the industry is talking so maybe if we lower the, the price of one MP3 from one euro to 80 cents, that would fix all of the problems. And it doesn't really fix anything, because if you legally want to buy an iPod and fill it with music, it would be two or three years of salary you have to pay. And still, you know, everyone has a full MP3 player. So that's kind of the basis of, of the whole discussion. You know, there's two sides where one side is totally ignorant and doesn't want to understand the other side, and the other side has the majority. Um, but the, others, the record industry has all the money, so that's an unfair balance. So I've always been very interested in this thing. And every time I went to discuss this with um, the industry, they always discussed and said, well, you know, the internet is bad, we can't make any money anymore. And I said, well, should you really make money anymore? You did distribution. We don't need you anymore. 
And they were really upset. And I said, well, you have to come up with something new, which makes you actually valuable to the community. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be around. And they, of course, don't want to do anything. They just want to get money for doing nothing, because that's a really nice job. I would love that as well. Um, but I, I decided I wanted to find a solution for, for the, the problem that they were talking about. And for me, it wasn't the problem of how to make an industry survive. For me, it was a possibility to help people that create to have more time to create. So I uh, came up with a concept, which in my world is a technological, technological solution to kind of solve issues or help people create. And this is my new project, so I'm going to show you a small video while I do some remixing up on stage. So thank you. I'm really happy you like that. So what we do is that we try to kind of take away some of the people that should not be needed anymore. And so instead of people giving money to a company that then takes 95% and give it to someone else, we should give it as directly as possible, because that's what we have on the internet. And as you probably know, we create much more content than ever before. And most of it we give out for free. So the price is not really that important to us. So we don't have a price tag on content. And that's the basis that Flutter works on, is that price tags are not valid when the information is available for free. So you have to rethink it. And Flutter became very, uh, uh, we got a lot of attention, not only because it, you know my background and so on, but also because we stood up for ideals, which we always do in every project I'm involved in. Uh, you probably know of WikiLeaks, and they got um, um, suspended from services like uh, PayPal and Visa and MasterCard wouldn't allow them to be used to help promote um, or give money to WikiLeaks. But you know, you can still give money to the KKK or any other normal organization, not just WikiLeaks. And this was a big problem, and we saw this more and more, that on the internet we've been more and more centralized. Even though we build a very decentralized system, we're giving away all of the power to few companies, so like PayPal, Facebook, and Google, and these very few companies, all based in the US, have 99% of the traffic we give them. You know, it, it's too much. And Flatter wanted to stand up for some sort of ideal, so we allowed WikiLeaks to use uh, Flatter, and they're one of the top earners on, on Flatter, obviously. Uh, and it's been very, very important to us and to them, I think. But Flatter is not only about giving money to web content or whatever you want to call it. So you can actually use Flatter inside a cell phone or whatever. We're very content agnostic, so we don't really care about what type of platform you're on or if it's offline or online or anything like that. As long as you can sync your information about who you want to give money to and why, that's fine with us. So right now we're experimenting with adding Flatter into media players. So that would mean that if you're outside walking on the street, whatever, listening to MP3s, and the MP3 player has support for Flatter. That would work. So you could Flatter when you listen to a new track on your MP3 player. So it's very 
try to be very content agnostic. And we think that with this, we can actually make people give money to each other on all type of user-generated content. And one really interesting thing is that uh, we don't have this uh, distinction between a producer and consumer on Flatter. We think everyone is the same. If you produce, you consume, and, and vice versa. And a really typical example is that uh, I know that some really big German newspapers are using Flatter, and I saw one article where the, there was a Flatter button underneath it that you could Flatter it, and they got like 20 Flatters. But one of the commenters, um, this newspaper allows people that comment to add their Flatter ID, so you could get Flattered for a comment. And the top comment had 40 Flatters, much more than the article itself. So it kind of shows that you know, it's a very strange world where people that comment or add value to something, which is not the basis of the content itself, might have more value than the original source. And that's very, very interesting. We don't know where that's going to end, but it's a very, very big experiment we're working on. And Flutter is, it looks like it's going very well. But I'm going to talk about why all of this has happened, like the reason not to be very scared about it. So it's a bit of a historical lesson here for all of you. You probably know all of this, so I'm just talking, but that's, you know, it's your problem. Um, so if you look back like 100 years, you didn't have sound for movies. Maybe there's someone old enough to remember this. I hope not. Uh, but when the sound movies came out, people were really upset because the only way you could make money as an artist at that time was maybe going to play in a theater while there was a movie playing. So there was thousands of people that were working as playing piano or playing in an orchestra just to movies. And they tried to ban sound movies. They tried to make it illegal to have sound in movies because they were scared of having no job. And that would have been quite stupid. So I'm glad that didn't work out. And if we go to the music industry, this is probably the one that is most affected by change because it's, it's very close to our heart and it's a very easy thing to understand. So if you go back like 100 years again, you know, as I said, the only way you made money in music was to play it live. So a lot of people had concerts and they played out on streets and that's how they financed everything. And they were really upset um, when this machine came out, the gramophone player, because all of a sudden they were scared that people would record music once and then someone would buy it and never listen to them play again and never pay them for the work. So they tried to ban the record player and said, this is going to destroy the music industry. And it turned out that people bought the music and then were more interested in music and went to see even more concerts and went to pay even more money to the, uh, the musicians. And then there's a new technology called the radio. And you know what happened? They said, this is going to destroy the music industry. And we have to ban the radio because it's going to make no, no one is going to buy records anymore and no one will go to concerts because you can just listen at home to music for free and no one will pay for it and so on. It turned out that radio was actually really good for money and the music industry. So they grew even more and people bought even more records than before and people went to even more concerts. So everything was fine. And then the cassette player came and people in the music industry said, oh no, this is going to kill the music industry. You know, it's a disruptive technology. People will not, you know, listen to radio anymore. They will record from radio, and then they will just walk around with the music and just listen to it and never buy anything again. And they will not go and buy records. They're not going to go to concerts. Um, but they, had, they were wrong again, obviously. And all of a sudden, you know, when they were making the most amount of money, they said, oh, let's try to be innovative and have something to do with the new revolution. So they made CDs and said, well, CDs are great because you can't copy them. Uh, and you can't copy them to, if you want to copy them, it would be to a cassette player and you would get not as good quality and so on. And I'm sorry it's ABBA, but it's, you know, someone has to be a little bit gay in here. <laughs> and what happened with the CD really is that all of a sudden the music turned into a digital form. So the thing is, with the digital form, it's really easy to copy it in perfect quality, which we could never do before. So you have digitalization, and then you have this thing of the internet, which gives you decentralization. So everything is digitized, everything is decentralized. And that equals democratization. All of a sudden, there's no gatekeeper, no one deciding which music you can and cannot listen to. So everyone can just take whatever album they have and give to whomever they want, and no one can say no to this. And people were really upset. And the industry, as you know, has been fighting this since day one. I remember Elton John, two years ago, said that the internet killed all creativity. There will be no creative people after the internet. So we need to shut it down. 
This is like Elton John two years ago. It's really crazy. Because of this, you know, they have no space because we don't need them anymore. And they're really understanding this, that we don't need middlemen anymore. We do this between each other. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. And that's really what happens. But really, you know, trying to stop this is really stupid because as Ladi told before, you know, sharing is a necessity and copying things is what we always do as people. So um, I'm going to tell you another story. Anyone in here, when you drink tea or coffee, would you lift your little finger like this? Up with hands, anyone? Yeah, a couple. I think most actually, but never mind. Do you know why you do it? Anyone heard this story? Okay, so I'm going to tell you. So the, the reason is that uh, you've seen people do it before you. So you copy the behavior of people. So it's not because like, some people think that it's to balance a cup or anything like that. It's actually because you've seen people do it. So intuitively, what you see is what you copy. So you use the behavior. And there was a researcher trying to find out the, the reason why we started doing this. And he came back to like, the 16th century, and he saw that uh, all the farmers, and all the, they were trying to copy what the, the royal people and you know, the really uh, rich people were doing. And you know, they saw, well, all of them are lifting the cups like this, so it must be fancy, so let's do that to try to be more fancy. And why did the rich people do it? Do you know? No? Um, OK. So in this time, you know, all of them were having big orgies. They were sleeping around quite a lot without condoms. And when you have no condom, you spread diseases if someone has it. And the first thing that happens with syphilis, if you get it, if you don't treat it, is that your fingers start to be stiff. So this is human behavior. Even if it's stupid, we're going to do it. And you know, we can't really stop it. So even like hundreds and hundreds of years later, you know, it's just part of our DNA now. We copied it, and it's there. So try stopping. Copying is really stupid. And the thing is that a lot of people have always been talking about this internet revolution or digital revolution. I don't really like that, because we are really hist we're not looking at history as we should. So a revolution is some people standing up to the man in the end because they're tired of something. That's not really what happened. Like with the revolution, you have, most of the time, you have a couple of people or even a large group of people, but very identifiable people that you can find and maybe cut their heads off and be done with them. But that's not really what the internet is. We've always been copying. We always had mediums to communicate, and that, that's you know, just an extension of it. So I would say it's evolution. And if you think about it, if you have evolution, you know, we can see back. 30 years, and you can see, maybe, try to look into the future, what all of this will become. So, 30 years ago, maybe there was a CD, and maybe you could copy it, and it would, you know, a CD burner would be 100 and, you know, maybe 15,000 euros to buy a CD burner. An empty CD would be maybe 200 euros, if you were lucky, and it would take two days to copy it, or something like that. It was totally crazy. And today, if you would copy a CD, it would take a couple of seconds or minutes, uh, but you wouldn't want to, because it's stupid. You don't want a CD anymore. It's old. Uh, even though it was really high-tech 30 years ago. So if, if you get a CD player, like a CD burner, you would throw it away. It just takes energy from your computer. You don't want it. So try to look 30 years into the future, and you see what kind of technology you have today that is in the same state as the first CD burner. And then you will see things like this. Uh, this machine is a 3D printer. It's called the RepRap. It's a machine that is built as an open source project. You can actually physically print things. So you can print things with plastic. You put plastic into the machine, you download objects, and you print them. So I have a friend who has one of these machines. We have one at our, my office as well, actually. We got it from a site called Thingiverse, where you can download things. A uh, really great site. You should check it out. But the thing is, you know, he has friends over sometimes, and if they have a big party and you know, he needs more glasses, he doesn't go out and buy glasses, he prints them. He downloads illegal copies of glasses and prints them. And we might laugh at this, but if you look at how you know, evolution is and how technology evolves, it's not you know, very far-fetched to believe that in 10, 20 years, you'll download a pair of jeans or a pair of sneakers. You know, it, it's really not that far-fetched. And at the same time, when we're trying to find new legislation of how to stop file sharing, we're also stopping these things. 
it's so important that we understand and put this in context. You know, copyright and patents and all of this, which we are dealing with every day, it has, you know, it's more than just about entertainment. It's more than just about how to make a, a really rich industry survive. It's how we want to do with our everyday lives in the future. So, thank you for listening. Thank you.